If the Bible is not the word of God, and it is simply just a proof text that we are going to, to affirm the things that we really want to do because we like this religion, then yeah, I think there's some merit. But if it's a supernatural book that is. contains the words of a living being who is a person who exists in a triune reality Amen. that is ruling and reigning and wrapping up all creation according to his will, if that God is speaking in a book, then what you hold in front of you is... As I am with my voice right now, he is with his voice in his word. Welcome to Family Life Today, where we want to help you pursue the relationships that matter most. I'm Shelby Abbott, and your hosts are David Ann Wilson. You can find us at FamilyLifeToday.com. This is Family Life Today. Never start a show this way, but I want to say I am Dave to the 23rd letter of Wilson. (laughs) (laughs) My family life today, and everybody's like, what is he Uh, talking about? We got K to the second letter, Uh B. Burgess and Uh Amin on the show today. Uh I mean, how cool is it to be able to say K to the second letter? (laughs) Right. I mean, seriously. I mean, you got something like that? It's, no, I don't. Yeah. Nothing? It's a, no. You get cumbersome real quick. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? And start, you know, tripping over a lot of words. K to the 15th. Yeah. Well, I had to add it up in my head. What's a W? Oh, it's the 23rd letter. I couldn't that even get That is impressive. Because yeah. uh, I, I don't know the alphabet unless I sing it. So <laughs> I got an A, B, C, D, and I'll do the math, and then I'll get to the number. So yeah. I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's really glad to have you guys on Family Life today. You've never been here. This is my first time on the show. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us, give us first impressions. What do you think? Man, first of all, these folks, uh, the salt of the earth. <laughs> yes. um, Listen, uh, taking good care of us and just the topics that y'all are tackling. Mm-hmm. Got to spend some time in lunch earlier today talking through uh, where we were going and also where y'all have been. Yeah. Uh, I am excited and I'm praying that by God's grace that we can add something of substance and edification um, to this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful institution. You, oh, you, guys, well, you, you, you guys will. You guys have been <laughs> friends for a long time. Yes. You have a podcast. Tell us what you do. Uh-huh. Tell us about your podcast. Yes, yeah. yeah, so we um we actually have a podcast called Southside Rabbi, uh-huh. and you can listen to it wherever you listen to How your podcast. How you come up with yeah, that name? I thought the so, same thing. So, okay, so it's kind of like a double entendre. So it's Southside Rabbi because me and him met each other, and we were raised in Southside St. Petersburg, Florida. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of an ode oh, to where we're from. Okay. But then we also use it as Southside Rabbi because Jesus is our rabbi. Rabbi, yeah. we he found us in the South Side, yes, yes, and so Jesus is in in a, in a sense a South Side Rabbi to us, absolutely, right? Mm-hmm. So um, that's how and, we came and, up with the name. And to add to that, just briefly, because mm-hmm. I, I just and I'm sorry, brother, I'm just so excited about who Jesus is, <laughs> yes. in that Jesus is forever, according to uh, Peter and Acts, the Jesus of Nazareth, and in Nazareth historically we know <laughs> would have been considered the South Side. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Part of the city that you try to build highways over so you don't have to get off on that exit. What good comes from Nazareth? What exactly. good comes from this place? And Peter makes a point to say that this Jesus at the right hand of the Father is still <laughs> the Savior yeah. from the South Side. Yeah. So, I, I, so I love the, the, the heart of God in his care for those who are often overlooked, under-resourced, or forgotten. And that's what South Side also encapsules. Amen. Gee, yeah. Liz, you're getting uh-huh. into dangerous Jesus stuff. Already. <laughs> I mean, really, that's, yeah, I mean, we haven't mentioned it, but your book, Dangerous Jesus, that's sort of, as I read it, isn't that sort of it? He is dangerous in yes. a really good way. Yes, indeed. He yeah. is. Uh, you, you're a sports guy. Yeah. I am so impressed. You're a pastor, uh, but you are uh, well connected. It's this brother right here. Y'all already know, 33 years as an NFL chaplain. We won't what say you, what team. Yeah, what, what are you, what are you doing, doing right now? But I, I like that. NFL. <laughs> Okay, so you have a podcast. That's what right. Else? And then yes. with Dangerous Jesus, I brought up the sports connection because we understand that word dangerous in the arena of combat or competition. Uh, if we say that the athlete is dangerous, what we mean is that that athlete is a danger to the other team. Yeah. Right. Uh, you have He's good. You got to watch him yeah. mm-hmm. um, or watch her. Right. And uh, in, in a lot of ways, Jesus 
is the sum and substance of all that is dangerous in that he is a threat to anything that would threaten us. Uh, and that is expansive, right? He is a threat to our division. He is a threat to uh, our injustice. He's a threat to our shame in that he brings a goodness that overcomes the threat with something so dramatically good that it cannot be denied. Yeah. That's who Jesus is. Uh, yet, I'm a rapper. So I, I got a <laughs> double entendres is the wor world I live in. Uh, there is a way that you can reimagine Jesus and stand him up as something that he is not that becomes an absolute danger in the traditional sense. Uh, I'm wearing a shirt right now with uh, one of my favorite American heroes, uh, Frederick Douglass, on it. And he, he had this treaty talking about the Christianity of the land that he was observing in the antebellum South because he was a slave. And he watched people pervert scripture and he watched folks uh, name the name of Christ, uh, do devotionals after doing great atrocity. He talks about mm. uh, church services where the chains of slaves are in the field uh, rattling while we are singing louder over the sound. And when he escaped slavery, this is an important point. He did not see that Christianity was the problem. Mm -hmm. He saw the perversion of it. He said, I actually love the Christianity of Christ. The Christianity of Christ actually drives my work. It drives my emphasis on liberation. But I hate the Christianity of this land that is human whipping and cradle stealing and so on and so forth. So there is this difference Oh, yeah. Of, of a Christianity of, of man's imagination versus the Christianity of Scripture, the Christianity of Christ, which is life to the world. The alternative is death. Yeah, and when I listen to Southside Rabbi, that's where you go. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah absolutely. So often to the beauty of who Christ, Christ is. But I didn't know your story. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. How they met. Uh -huh. Oh, yes, yes. So walk us through that. As our, our listeners got to hear that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we, me and KB met when we were in high school. And so we're grown men now. Yep, yep, but we were way. kids when we met. Um, I, I was about 15 years old. And uh, at the time, I was being convicted of my sin. Okay. And, and the way that this happened is my mother bought me a Bible. Um, she took me to a Christian bookstore, bought me a Bible, put my name in it in gold. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's official. <laughs> it's right now. You're it's in. official. I got my own now. I've got a seat in heaven. It's waiting for me. Um, and so I felt like having the Bible was a rite of passage as a kid. I saw all of, you know, the adults that I knew had a Bible. My grandmother had a Bible. My uncles. And, and you was, always went to church? And I was raised in the church, yeah, yeah. right? And Probably so, a big old Bible, too, right? Yeah, they, they had the big yeah. Bible. Oh, you know, the, the Bible, big, you the come big in, of the faith. The big, <laughs> the big Bible, you come in the house and it's the centerpiece. Uh -huh. And so um, I was raised in the church. So as a kid, I was always going to the church. My grandmother did the announcements at the church. And my mother took me to church every Sunday, even when I didn't want to go. And uh, when I became a teenager, she stopped forcing me to go to church. So I gladly accepted it and just didn't go. <laughs> and uh, But she did one day out of the blue on a Saturday morning say, I'm going to take you to a Christian bookstore and buy you your own Bible. So I got a Bible and I remember when I was excited about it and I got got home and I opened it and I don't know how because I didn't I don't know how to navigate the Bible at this time but I came across the Ten Commandments and when I read them I said I have broken all of these commandments every one of these and twice I was on like Sunday. oh shoot <laughs> yes maybe twice twice today um and so once I read the Ten Commandments and I saw that I had broken them I just started feeling at this time, I didn't know that this is what it was, but conviction about my sin. Mm -hmm. So I tried to go back to just living my life as a sinner, because I was, mm -hmm. and I could not do it comfortably because every time I would go to just try to live my life and go back to the, the sins that I was committing, there was something in the back of my mind kind and in my heart. Master. Yes, that was constantly <laughs> disturbing. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, as yes. Paul says. Yeah, that boy. The law Pauline, is, is, baby. Pauline. <laughs> <laughs> Talks about how the law is a, is a taskmaster, a schoolmaster yeah. to show you that you have broken these bro broken God's laws and show you your need for a savior. And so I was trying to live my life the way that I knew how, just going back and doing what I was doing, and I just could not shake the conviction. Mm -hmm. And the conviction got so bad that I said, I have to do something about this. The language that I would use now is every morning when I woke up, I felt like God was disappointed with me, yeah. that he was mm -hmm. mad at me. Yeah. And I used to wake up and just feel it. And uh, it makes me think about what it says in the Bible how it talks about how God's wrath is abiding on, yeah, yeah, on yeah. those who are rebelling against him. And that's what it felt like. Mm. And so I said, okay, what do Christians do? How can I make God happy? 
They go to church. They don't do things like curse yeah. and <laughs> other bad things. Yeah. And uh, they own suits. They, they, <laughs> <laughs> they own suits, right? <laughs> and so I just started driving myself to church because I was like, I want to make God happy. So I would get up and take myself to church on Sunday. So you're performing for I'm him. performing. Yes. I'm doing white knuckle effort. Yeah. I don't know it at the time, but I'm trying to earn my salvation by my own righteousness, yep. right? Which is impossible. Yes. And and I felt it. So uh, I got to church and I didn't like it. I didn't understand what the preacher was talking about. He was up there sweating and yelling at me. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know what was going on. Everybody was clapping. I didn't know why they was clapping because he's yelling and sweating. <laughs> and so uh, I was like, I don't like this. Everyone, There's no one here my age. I don't understand what this guy is talking about, so I'm not coming back here, right? And then I tried to, I, I, I went home uh, one weekend and I opened my Bible on a Saturday morning and I tried to read it and it was like reading hieroglyphics. And I was like, I don't understand what this stuff is saying. And I had the NLT version too. So Whoa, you, you, know, if you, can't read, if you can't read the NLT. <laughs> no, these it's and a spiritual those? problem. It, it wasn't a comprehension problem. You might be too far. Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. I'm if you joking. had a living Bible, you would have you got it. I know, right? It's a Jesus and his homeboy came to <laughs> so um I was just like um I remember I was I was sitting on the front steps and I tried to read the Bible I couldn't understand it and then I was trying to stop just living a life of sin and I couldn't I just felt like I kept messing up every day that I tried to be a better person I couldn't and tried to stop doing bad stuff I couldn't and I closed the Bible and I said this is impossible mm-hmm. No one can do this. Mm. I remember saying that in my brain. Mm. And I said, if Christians, if there are Christians out there that are doing this, they are faking it yeah. because yeah. I have tried with all of my might. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, God, you know, I've tried to stop cursing. I've tried to stop anything bad. I've tried to stop doing it. I've driven myself to church. I'm trying to read the Bible. It doesn't work. Yep. So I, I, I just like it. You didn't uh, list the other sins. I didn't, but you know, a, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we get it, man. How, we get what it. did they say? It took about seven it. years yeah. until the, 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 the charges aren't against you anymore. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, so I... um. I I was just like, I can't do this. This is impossible. And I gave up. And uh, in God's providence, not too long after that happened, because after I, I was like, God, this is impossible, I still had this desire to make God happy. I was just like, I just still, though— want to please God and I can't shake the fact that he's disappointed with me mm. and I want to please him but I just don't know I didn't know what to do and so um, just a few months after that I met KB uh, at the grocery store that we got this job at this new grocery store we met each other <laughs> at orientation mm-hmm. and he told me that he was a Christian um, you told him that right off the no, bat? No, he didn't tell me right off the bat. We okay. we met at orientation and we had a great time. Like okay. we, we hit it off. We we had everything in common. We were laughing and joking during yeah. orientation. So you love this guy. Yeah, yeah, we like became friends instantly yeah, yeah, yeah. at the orientation. And then when I worked with him, probably like a week or so after that, yeah. we had, we worked a whole shift together. It was the same chemistry. And then after that, he told me he was a Christian. Yep. And I was shocked. How'd I was that like, go? Did you, were you, Was yeah. that hard, KB, to even tell him? Or was that just a part of who you were at that time? It flowed out of who I was. Yeah. Um, and uh, and that that's always in the back of my mind too. Um, where I'm, I'm clear out the gate. I am always disguised as, as an evangelist. I'm always disguised <laughs> yeah. as an evangelist. So <laughs> it was in my mind, in my heart, and um, as we were talking, we just connected over sneaker culture, hip hop culture. Yeah. And uh, and I and I brought up the fact that I I, I had knew Jesus and Jesus had saved my life. Yep. And, uh, and you were doing Christian music. And I was I started doing making Christian music. Um and uh, and I started playing some stuff for for Amin and and then Amin just started peppering me with questions. Yeah. He just started asking me, well, what does God feel about this? What does God feel about that? Uh, and we spent. Every single day together. Yeah, we did every day, <laughs> and we would we would we would walk through scripture. We would we would talk about the different ways in which this applies to our lives, mm-hmm. and it got to a place where it was clear to me that God was closing the deal. Okay? Yeah, that's- <laughs> now, I, I hate to put it that way because it's not a transaction. <laughs> but me and I mean, last night I got invited to m- m- one of my neighbor's house and he is of a different religion and uh, he showed me where he worships his gods and, um, mm. and he's Hindu. And we were sitting there talking and I asked him, do the gods talk back to you? Mm. And I, he kind of he paused for a second and was like, 
no, I am filled with way too much sin. God would never talk to me. And I mean, as soon as I told him I mean the story, he said, lay up! Yeah. That's a fastball right down the middle. Fastball right down the middle. And you are, and you are Mark McGuire on steroids. <laughs> hey, you're about but to hit we, that thing out of the park. But that's how it felt. So it was, yeah. it's the same situation. It was like, yeah, like, this is clearly a alley-oop. God is ready to slam this. And I, I slid him the very album that yep. led me to Jesus. It was an album called Bloody Street. Volume one. I thought it was about hurting people in the streets, but it was about the blood of Jesus that is extended to everyone, especially those who are in the streets. Yeah. And it was uh, an album that had eight songs on it. The eighth song was a gospel presentation. I believed on Jesus. It changed my life. And then a year later, I meet this man and we go through this process of asking questions. Very Nicodemus in the night yes, like. Yeah, and that's I what gave, it was like. Nick at night. Nick and at night. I Nick gave night. him <laughs> the CD. And uh, he went into my uh, the same room that I trusted. I just thought about that. The same room I trusted Jesus in. Oh, wow. Same room. You what do went you mean? into that. So I had a room at my grandmother's house. Yeah. Oh, really? And yeah. I listened to the CD in that room. Wow. Eight songs, eight songs of gospel presentation. He led me in the, the, the rapper led me in a prayer. I trusted Jesus and w- was been walking with him ever since. I gave Amin that CD. He went into that room, closed the door, and I waited out in the kitchen, <laughs> praying the Lord, Lord, make it stick. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> oh my God. So I mean, he did the same thing. Yeah. And then I mean, went home after that. And just I to did be it sure, again. I did it again. He, did yeah, it I again. gave him the CD or gave him, it was on an MP3 player. Sorry. And he took it. Took it home, listened to it again, and uh, we've been we've been best friends ever best since. Best friends ever since. And that was two thousand six. Two thousand six, I think. And got the honor of discipling I mean, and and now he disciples me. So, so. I mean, <laughs> like, did that blow your mind? Your mind this this idea of grace? Yes, it did. Um, it felt. It also felt like. Uh, I, I always describe it like in the moment. It felt like a film because it felt like everything that had happened in my life was leading up to this moment. Right, that this was like the zenith, mm. uh, and uh, and I was like, this is what I'm here for. That's what I felt, mm-hmm. and it's weird because I I at the time I didn't know much about you know God or His sovereignty and His providence, but I did know at the time this felt bigger than me, mm. and it felt like this is why I'm here. Mm. It was to get to this moment. Yes, and um and yeah, I, I was just blown away by the grace of God and. Also, you know what I was really blown away by? I was blown away by God being able to relate to someone like me in my culture. Mm. Because I thought that Christians, as we talked about a little bit earlier, looked like Steve Urkel. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I didn't know that Christians can dress in Jordans and be a part of kind of hip-hop culture. I didn't know there was Christian hip-hop. I didn't know any of that. And I was blown away by the fact that God was very much so present in the culture of the South Side of of where I grew up. Mm. And that what made me say God cares about us yeah um, yeah, and, and yeah, and, mm-hmm. that, and, and that God relates to us in, the, in this way. Well, I find yeah. it interesting too. How important was it that you actually liked this guy? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean, saying? well, God knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. so, so what I was thinking is so often, I mean, we know this as a preacher, you know, this, they're not going to listen to the message unless they appreciate or like the messenger. True. And so Christians are so often hated, Mm. hypocritical judgment or whatever. And so they try and share Christ with somebody and they're not liked. And I'm not saying we cow down to to the culture to be liked. Of course. But he's laughing. You enjoy this guy. You guys connected at that orientation. There's already something you like about it. And then when he hands you something, you're like, I'm interested in If you didn't like this dude, and he's like, I want to lead you to Jesus, you're like, I'm not interested in your Jesus, right? right? Or he's hypocritical. Or he's hypocritical. Or if he treated me like a project, which I feel like Christians do in evangelism too, is that they meet a person and just say, oh, you're just a gospel project. You're not really a human being. So I don't don't really care about you You as a person or what your story, what you're interested in. I'm only feigning to care about those things to get you to a gospel presentation. That doesn't work either. I think that loving your neighbor means that you have to care about them and their life and their humanity. And that comes out when you're, that authenticity comes out when you're actually talking to someone and forming a relationship with them. You know? And so I didn't didn't feel like I was just a a project to preach the gospel at. I felt like I was a human being that another human being uh, loved and cared for and was trying to reach. Absolutely. So how's how's this relationship Relationship developed into Southside Rabbi and everything else you're doing. Yeah, so what's uh, the vision? What's the they're vision? They're wearing like, aren't they wearing the coolest? Thank you. Stuff? Shout yeah. out to Native Supply, um, <laughs> and uh, which is uh, we might have to put a link in the show notes. Oh yes, hey, please, brother. We will not argue this. with you. Native <laughs> <Day fly. laughs> but uh, as long as I can remember, we we have been pretty serious about our father's business, and and, and, I, and I'll say. 
we trusted Jesus when we were young. I wish I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, there there are, are wounds that I certainly would have avoided if I would have trusted Jesus when I was, you know, eight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. But we, from the inception of our friendship, um, became very serious about the kingdom of God. Mm. And uh, so we spent our times, we, we, we weren't clubbing or partying. And I'm not particularly trying to come at folks that do that. I'm just saying that just was not on our mind as teenagers. You had bigger business. We yes. had bigger business. Yes. We had funner business. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And, Very uh, true. And, and so what we, what we did was we continued to keep this rhythm. Uh, and this rhythm stayed the rhythm probably until uh, we were probably 24, 25 years mm-hmm. old. It started mm-hmm. to look different once we got married and started having kids uh, <laughs> and had to have jobs and stuff. Uh, <laughs> but before that... I thank God a job. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, had to live and, and pay bills yeah, and stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It's like, hey, man, I cannot just be sharing the gospel till 3 a.m. <laughs> uh, I got to do other stuff. But anyways, we would be very, very vocal about our, our faith. So we would, and I cannot agree with you more, the gospel does not need your help being hard. Yeah. So, yeah, so sure. adding your yeah. your sharpness to it yeah. uh, is is not helping anyone. It may make you feel better, maybe <laughs> stroke your ego, but it is not helping people to believe. Um, so, but we were very vocal about our witness, our we weren't trained. I mean, I, we end up getting going to Bible college and stuff like that. But initially, I just had a witness. God <laughs> save me. It's possible. Yeah. Look, you read about Lazarus. I can show you Lazarus right now in a 16-year-old black man from Southside St. Petersburg. <laughs> mm. I am Lazarus. Mm. And, uh, and we went very, very vocal about that. We, yeah. God also had to get a hold of relationship that we had with our parents because what I would find uh, is that we would, uh, we, we weren't necessarily thinking about how we might honor our parents along with being serious about evangelizing yeah. the, the, the the world. So we made also our relationship with our parents a location for God's effect on our lives. So really? I cannot be out here talking about how great Jesus is if I disrespect my mom. So we wanted our, our our, our families to look at us and say th- they have been changed lest the change is not real yeah, yeah. yeah so yeah. um so you were thinking that in high school we were thinking about that in high school Man, that's, absolutely that's, that's deep sure. yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. and and so and then and then we studied scripture so we spent a yeah. lot of time diving into the the, the word that led us through su- a few traditions theologically some that I will not name <laughs> uh but uh, I like where we are now <laughs> yes uh, God. <laughs> and that just grew HGA a lot of folks know me as as KBHGA, I'm always talking about HGA. That was the name of a micro movement that was happening in the Tampa Bay, St. Pete area, where God was bringing in a bunch of unchurched, ragtag, oftentimes forgotten individuals into community with one another. And we were studying theology, sharing the gospel. In fact, it grew to the point where it became unhealthy for us to continue to meet in my two bedroom roach infested (laughs) apartment (laughs) because, like, folks were like getting saved and wanting to get baptized, and then we're doing community. No pastors, no elders here. So we actually dispersed into churches mm. to serve our local Because it was becoming a mini church. Oh, it was a church. It was, that, that, and, that, I was the, and I was the honorary pastor. You know what I'm saying? I was like counseling people till 3 a.m. In, in the morning and like, hold up. And you probably got I? paid like a pastor too, oh, right? Oh, actually. Right. I never filed taxes until I was 23. And, and Uncle Sam, it's because I was broke. So don't come to me. Um, so anyways. I mean, what would it have been like if you guys hadn't uh, had each other? Man, it would have been, I question. think that would have been hard. Yeah. I, I, I can't imagine. Um, I think God knew in his providence what he was doing because one of the things that I felt when I first came to know the Lord, I think we, we both felt this. We didn't know a lot of people our age that were serving the Lord when we when we first met each other. Yeah. And I think that me and him felt like, well, as long as it's just us. Yeah. We're cool. Yeah. Like, we'll be the two weird guys <laughs> in South St. Petersburg Bad that's job. talking to everybody about yep. Jesus, yep. right? Like, and it, and it felt like um, as long as I have somebody else, I mean, not that you necessarily need that, but God, we need community. Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. And so I think God knew that we needed each other to keep going. Yeah. And we had each other. And then God slowly brought around other people. Mm-hmm. And, um, but man, we really need each other. And then his discipleship helped me because he was a year ahead of me in high school. So he, he helped coach me through how do I navigate high school now as a Christian? Mm, yeah. How do I navigate prom? How yeah. do I navigate being invited to parties? How do I navigate, you know, all of the high school life? That was all helpful for me. Yeah, I didn't have it. to learn by a lot of trial and error mm. because I actually learned by his trial and error. Yes. You know what I, I mean? Several. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, talk about uh, your bold. 
You guys are bold. You're loud. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. I don't mean volume. Jesus. I mean your life is loud in your face. And I again, I don't know you, you know, behind the scenes, uh-huh. but what I've seen, but I mean there's a dangerous Jesus that's dangerous in you, which is really attractive. We had a quarterback come to the Lions years ago that was like you guys. He's bold, mm-hmm. confident. Yeah. And in one season, yeah. our listeners have heard this, we baptized 27 players. Wow. That's a revival in an NFL. That is a revival. And it was because of his bold. I mean, he brought a Bible as big as his table. <laughs> Yeah. Plopped it down and said, this is who I am, this is where we're, and he was an evangelist. You guys remind me of John Kidd now. Oh, I'm like, I love wow. wow. So, I mean, where does that boldness come from? I, I would say, uh, I believe it, man. Yeah. I, I believe it. You know, the, the, the fact of the matter is ministry in the West is rubbing shoulders, rather, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, with business. I mean, this, this, there's, uh, these are full operations that have staff and 401ks. And whenever sponsorship begins to get introduced to the table, uh, you have considerations you didn't have before. It's like, you know, <laughs> yeah. first, you're, first you're just thinking about, man, what can we do that is the most effective to reach people? And then you're like, what can I do to keep the lights on and people paid? Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and some oh. of that can be, that's not all bad. I mean, right, the, right, I, I right. want to make sure that people in my organization have, you yeah. know, jobs and, and, and health care, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I get the conflict, but I think that I need regular calibration and God, by God's grace, he has surrounded me with good men and women, many of them older than I am that have, I've been able to be on their coattails to navigate this world. And what I pull from regularly is I need escapes from all of the show, the, all of the, the lights, the cameras. Um, and I need to get away and I need to reevaluate where I stand. Do I believe? And as I continue to go back, Sadie, uh, y'all, I'm sure y'all know, uh, Sadie Robinson. I'm not saying her name right, right? Sadie Robinson. We had her parents on just a little while ago. Beautiful. Oh, wow. About Beautiful. the movie, The Blind. Have you seen it? No, no, no. I haven't uh-uh. seen it. No, oh, you guys I've heard about it. Incredible. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's, about, it's yeah. about their dad. But anyway, Sadie has a voice. Sadie, Sadie She's always preached. speaking at Passion. She's yes. amazing. And you were there too. Yes, I just heard her preach a sermon. Um, she, she preached at Passion, and I, I got to hear her message. And I had never heard a full Sadie sermon before. The question that she posed was, how do I know that God is real? That Because that was the question she was asked. Mm-hmm. And she gave a very simple answer that she had pulled from another speaker, that uh, Louis. She was talking to Louis Giglio, and yeah. Louis said, I, be- I know that God is real because of the Bible. Which, for people in who had these kind of debates online, they would say, well, that's oddly circular. Yeah. Yeah, You're saying that exactly. the Bible tells you God is real, and then yeah. you also go to the Bible to know that God is real. <laughs> this is like a, a, a yeah. circular yeah. argument. But yeah. it's circular. Oh, my goodness. Y'all about to give me preaching in here. Yeah. Let's go. It's circular <laughs> if it isn't true. Okay. Mm. If the Bible is not the word of God and it is simply just a proof text that we are going to, to affirm the things that we really want to do because we like this religion, then yeah, I think there's some merit. But if it's a supernatural book that contains the words of a living being who is a person who exists in a triune reality that is ruling and reigning and wrapping up all creation according to his will, if that God is speaking in a book, then what you hold in front of you is as I am with my voice right now. You know it's me Mm -hmm. because it's my voice. (laughs) Right. (laughs) He is with his voice in his word. Mm. Yeah. And this is the 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 emphasis that she made in this this message around that the Bible is to be it can be trusted it is to be trusted and in it you will find the testimony of the Lord Jesus Christ where you find life. Right. And I am constantly needing. And I'll be honest. I'll say this to you all. I don't know if I've said this on the podcast. I had a moment in the last couple of years where I was experiencing some success that I'd never seen before, and. It made me, for the first time in almost 11 years of doing this, I got off stage one time and I missed it. I missed the applause. I'd never felt it before. And it scared me because I know on the other end of drinking deeply, the drug of fame, there's an artist in my mind right now that that literally he, he said to a friend of mine that fame is the safest drug so I'm addicted to it. Mm. And he is wrong. It is not safe. Mm. Fame is dangerous. Just not bad, but dangerous. And I 
took that to my, uh, I, there's a couple pastors in my life, uh, great therapists, uh, my wife, I confessed it to my brothers. And we decided that the most courageous thing for me to do was not to push through it, but to stop and slow down. And I took almost six months off the road just to recalibrate. And I saw all that to say, I want to be certain that I believe. And as I continue to revisit the voice of God and see God's work in saving and rescuing the lost, I am reminded what I am doing and why I am doing it. And I don't know how you could be on that and not be bold. We're Dave and Ann Wilson, and you've been listening to Family Life Today. We've been talking with KB and Amin Hudson, and KB's written a book called Dangerous Jesus, Why the Only Thing More Risky Than Getting Jesus Right is Getting Jesus Wrong. And you can get a copy at familylifetoday.com. And you might not know this about Family Life, but we're donor-supported. That means that conversations like today's get into people's homes and cars because of financial partners who believe in reaching others with God's plan for families. And right now, when you partner financially with Family Life to help more conversations like today's get into more homes, we want to send you as our thanks a copy of Sissy Goff's book, The Worry-Free Parent. Sounds like a good book, doesn't it? The Worry-Free Parent, <laughs> Living in Confidence So Your Kids Can Too. You can partner with us at FamilyLifeToday.com or by calling 800-358-6329. That's 1-800-F as in family, L as in life, and then the word today. Or you can mail your donation to Family Life, 100 Lake Heart Drive, Orlando, Florida, 32832. Make sure to let us know you'd like a copy of The Worry-Free Parent by Sissy Goff. And let me say thanks for partnering with Family Life. And if you know anyone who needs to hear today's conversation, would you share it with them from wherever you get your podcasts? And while you're there, you can help others learn about Family Life today by leaving us a review. We're Ann and Dave Wilson, and we'll see you back next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a donor-supported production of Family Life, a crew ministry. Helping you pursue the relationships that matter most.